Welcome everyone. We're really excited to share our equipment and role in pedagogy discussion with you today. Um, we know that you've probably seen our bios, uh, Abigail Alba, and then we also have Lynn Denning with us today. And um, before we get started, however, if you have read some of our bios, I think it would be really interesting to discuss a little bit about how we came to the whole topic of equipment or the whole world, I guess I should say, actually, of equipment and its relationship to our bodies, our habits, playing in general. Um, so yeah, Lynn, how did you really get started, would you say, on your equipment journey? Abby, I'd, I'd say that that started from the very first day that I was introduced to the violin in the public schools. And uh, you might say that the situation was set up right from the beginning because that teacher didn't deal at all with equipment. Uh, basically, we had an instrument in front of us. We had music that was put in front of us. We had our whole bows to, uh, in the, the very first method, uh, right. whole notes to, to master. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I have to say that I stumbled through not only violin instruction, but also the whole thing of equipment. Um, and to the point that when I really started playing very seriously, I started having physical problems. And I thought, well, maybe that's, you know, I lack talent, or maybe I'm just not very smart. Um, you know, maybe I'm not built for this instrument. Um, and uh, you, you might say, um, one set of stars aligned when I came into contact with Mr. Roland and the very first lesson he said, do you have any complaints? And I said, oh yeah, it feels like somebody's stabbing me in the shoulder with a knife. And he shook his head and uh, he took off my shoulder pad and my chin rest and he said, now go away and play. And uh, it would, in the next couple of lessons, he gave back uh, a chin rest that he somehow or another felt was a good match uh, for me. And uh, that's when light bulbs started going off in my head. It's like, it's not talent. It's not my physical structure. It's not that I'm smarter or less smart. It's the equipment. And oh my goodness, the pain went away. So that was a real heads up for me. And uh, Abby, uh, I have to say that when we finally met, that that too was, was a path that paths that crossed or stars that aligned. And uh, we saw that, my goodness, we have so much in common. Uh, you with an Alexander Technique background. Um, and why don't you talk about how that, how that happened? Yeah, so... Um... I know uh, people may have heard in the Alexander Technique presentation that, um, you know, I struggle with a lot of uh, injury tendonitis in early high school, and then that kind of manifested at the source, which was the spine or is the spine uh, in undergrad. And um, I had been trying out some different chin rests, really not getting super comfortable. Of course, I've been trying out lots of shoulder rests, um, but at that kind of peak of my injury, um, I still hadn't come across really well-fitting equipment. So then when I did, when I met you, it was not only a light bulb or stars, you know, aligning for the fact that um, I was finally coming across equipment that I didn't have to sacrifice my body for, but also it was just like we were kind of two peas in a pod, you know, talking about the body, talking about differences in equipment and what the body needs and individual needs. And um, I just remember coming away from that first um, session that I had with you going, this is just, this has just impacted me greatly. And that's when you invited me to teach Alexander Technique at one of the George Mason, Paul Rowland String Pedagogy workshops. Um, and since then, gosh, we've had so much fun doing, I don't know, we've probably done at least, gosh, five or so, five or seven even presentations together for ASTA, different workshops and, and whatnot. Um, and the journey's just, just going to continue. Okay. okay, well, let's get into some of the nitty gritty of equipment. And what we're going to take a look at first is 
Paul Rowland's view on equipment, uh, what one should use, and a little bit of why uh, he felt that we, we really should take a look at the equipment that we use. We're also going to take a look at how the body works, how it moves best, and then we're going to take a look at some of the problems that result from either habit that that we've brought from from possibly our equipment creating bad habits um, and also the the resolution of those habits uh, because of equipment so lynn why don't you talk a little bit about why equipment was so important to paul roland sure you know i can't say that mr roland actually came out uh, and said in my lessons, equipment is important. And then also, Abby, what he was doing was that all of his new students, he took away their hard shoulder pads. And so basically all of us uh, were playing without a shoulder pad. Um, well, real quick question though, how, how did that affect everybody's playing? Like, did people feel like they had to retrain themselves to shift and use vibrato and things like that? Definitely. I mean, uh, basically what Mr. Roland was doing when he took away my shoulder pad and my chin rest is that he was helping me to engage my left hand in instrument support. And mm -hmm. this, this is something that is, I, I probably has been dealt with in the previous session on uh, uh, instrument positioning. But basically Mr. Roland's view was uh, to have a uh, to have rather than a diving board approach to holding the instrument where the left hand is out there flapping around, right. his, his approach was, uh, as he, he put it, um, a bridge approach. So there was light dynamic support in the left hand as one plays. And yes, this took some getting used to. Um, but also I was so motivated to learn this because I was in such pain previously that mm -hmm. I knew I was going to have to give up playing unless I made this change. Right. So it just, it kind of took the top of Pandora's box, but it also did it in a marvelous way. It, it really did. I mean, it was, it was a, a life changing occurrence and certainly something that uh, Mr. Roland, well, he, he was looking for changes. He was looking for changes that he began to see that we had ease in our neck and shoulders. Right. And uh, also because we were no longer hitched up on one side, uh, left hand actually had more freedom in the long run, especially this left shoulder joint area. Yes. That's really what he was looking for, Abby. Um, he wanted to see that when, when we moved from string to string, we were, the, our left side was free enough that we could move from string to string. He wanted to see that the, the left elbow could precede uh, movement, uh, could precede the shift. Right. And uh, yeah, so, and then also because our shoulders and neck were freer, you began to see a little bit of wobbling of the head on top of the chin rest. And I think we're going to discover in your presentation, this part of the presentation, why that's really important. So Lynn, let's talk about how having an injury affects changing our equipment. Well, you know, um, in any, just about in any situation, we choose relationships. And those relationships can either be functional or dysfunctional. And it's when pain happens, whether that's in a relationship, uh, you know, friends, uh, the career that we choose, the automobile that we drive and the setting of the seat or the shape of the right. seat, um, that, uh, that we have to say, is this suited to me? And one of the- Right, is what, this working for me? That's right, exactly. That's right. And one of the ways of knowing that it's not working is through pain. And so if your equipment, well, if, if you are in pain when you play, Certainly you're going to be using a lot of the techniques that you've, you've learned this week from uh, this workshop and Paul Roland Pedagogy. But also you're gonna start asking yourself, hmm, is my equipment the source of that pain? 
is my is my equipment asking me to be dysfunctional in the way that I move? So yeah, a, equipment can be that that crossroads of what what do I need to be a whole complete person that mo moves in a human way? Yeah, and Abby, uh, one thing, and you've you've heard me say this. One thing that I tell uh, new clients when they walk in the door, you, you need to realize that a chin rest, its job is it, it doesn't do windows and it doesn't walk the dog, <laughs> right? That you you do need to take a look at you. Um, are your movement patterns are is body balance what it should be? If you've had injuries you need to deal with those injuries. And right. for, for some people, they I, 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 I tell them that, you know, this might not be your only chin rest fitting. After you heal, come back and we'll, we'll do this again. So Abby, uh, what we were just saying is that sometimes the body brings a habit to playing that actually has to be dealt with. And certainly we're seeing this week ways of dealing with that, but also um, there are signs, there are visual signs that there is a habit there. Why don't you talk about some of those visual signs uh, that can contribute to playing problems and eventually to pain? Sure, yes, I'd like to put them in two big categories. Uh, mostly because I used to do both of them quite pronounced. Um, one, let's call clamping, okay? And that is when you see the left shoulder or the right shoulder for that matter, coming closer to the ear on that side. Okay, so the head and the shoulder would come together. And we could also see it this way as well. And that is just a recipe for terrible strain on the arm uh, rigidity in fingers, uh, lack of movement shifting, lack of a healthy vibrato sound, and lack of mobility of the head. It also leads to just tons, leads us to tons of pain. I also want to put the second category out there, which is what I call turtling. And I love turtles, but let's not try to be one. And that's when our head is going to kind of come forward or get poked forward with the balance of the head not being on top of the spine anymore. So the head would fall forward or be collapsed forward or clamp forward mm -hmm. and even could be in combination with the clamping. And that's something that you'll also see from the side that kind of looks, you know, down and forward. If people also have postural issues, they'd be more lent to have that kind of turtling approach going on. So that's a big, big habit in the body that has to be addressed even when we change equipment. Both of those habits really need to be addressed. So speaking of turtling, let's go ahead and look at a couple pictures that really demonstrate that and show us what that looks like. Here's a person we know that is turtling a bit. Lynn, why don't you give us a little lowdown on this? What you would see when a person is turtling, well, let's put it this way. If the person's older, it's actually quite easy to see this because this the skin right here, which is called a dewlap officially, mm -hmm. um, you're going to see that stretching forward. And this is certainly an example of this person uh, turtling, reaching out over the tailpiece for instrument stability. Uh, for younger people, you, you will see that, I'll pretend I'm a younger person, and you will see that, that stretch of skin underneath. And that's right. just a sign that the head is not on top of the spine. Let's go on to face plane now. This is a really interesting one. Let's look at a couple pictures of this. Oh, here's such an extreme version. We've got such a clamping going to the left here. It's really, really incredible. Great. Let's look at another extreme uh, look at face plane or an extreme case of it. And this person we can see is tilting the total opposite direction from the last photo, totally to the right now. Here's shoulder left. So this goes hand in hand with clamping. Um, and so let's just take a look at a couple pictures here about it. 
All right, here's a very extreme case where we see a lot of clamping going on and that left shoulder is really high. That you can look at as a player, as a teacher, is uh, the relationship of the, the head with the spine. And basically a starting point is um, a, a cross where you have uh, 90 degree angles on either side of, of this, the, the shoulders and the neck. It's again to say that that's a starting point for, for good health that again you want to have equipment that's going to allow your head and neck to move in any direction based on what's going on in the music and some of the saddest examples that i've seen of dysfunction in playing have to do with the angle of the neck let's take a, a look at a few pictures here so you see that no longer do you have this this uh, 90 degree angle with the shoulders and the neck but there's a tilt of the neck one way or the other um, that is held for a long duration for as long as the person is playing. And this, this leads to um, physical problems, to pain, and uh, to dysfunction as far as the body is concerned. If the head and neck and back are not organized well, then everything else is working so much harder. And these are just really extreme examples of this. This last picture, we can see there's even this, this bulging of the neck with the head coming forward. And that curvature that you can see in this picture of the white line that's curved, that should actually be that nice little concave cervical spine, which is the, the curve of the neck. It should be this way and not actually uh, straightened or forward. So one of the things that I want to talk about and kind of demo a little bit, because uh, we see it in a lot of the pictures, but we're also not looking three-dimensionally at these mm. layers right now. So let's discuss a little bit of some arm pitfalls. And a lot of the factors that I'm about to talk about really go together. One of the big things we'll see with clamping and turtling and poor fitting equipment, poorly fitting equipment, is that we will see the elbow go backwards We'll also see the left thumb gripping. And we'll also notice that that leads us to using the outside corners of the fingertips, which then really affect pitch and um, tone quality, all kinds of things, vibrato for sure, shifting. That clamping that we see, and that can come with, you know, the head or this way. Also that tension then travels down the rest of the arm and we'll see that elbow getting pulled in really weird ways, which then you can just see here changes the angle of my hand and wrist and fingers. And Lynn, talk a little bit more about an ulnar deviation that we are possibly seeing with this too. Sure. Um, one of the problems with uh, hard shoulder pad use or incorrect equipment is that the, uh, the instrument is flipped down to the lower string and basically the hand follows that. So yeah, you would see this. So the, the pinky finger, the musculature is shortened on this side and that's known as ulnar deviation because it's the radius on this side and the ulnar on uh, this side and ulna on this side. And so it's this ulnar deviation that you often see. Altitude uh, is the next problem that we're going to talk about. And this has to do with the actual altitude of the instrument. So depending on where the instrument is in relationship to the nose and the chin, you'll sometimes see that the instrument is propped up even so far as the mouth. Or if it's a little bit better altitude, it's gonna be below chin level. And, by, and what you're going to be using for the frame of reference is the top of the bridge. So very often the top of the bridge will be way up here or sometimes it'll be down here. Yeah, so you see in this particular circumstance that the bridge is actually over top of uh, the mouth. Now you might say, well, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that when you reach up, particularly for the G and the D strings, you very often have something like this. And so you see the player playing with the hand way up here. And again, you'd say, well, so what's the big deal? Basically, we're designed to keep our hands and our arms at about mouth level. I mean, for obvious reasons, that's how we eat. Right. And so when we, go, um, when we go to a lower string momentarily, that's no problem. But if the E string that, that, or the top string is way up here to begin with, 
then we're always working out of design function. And basically, we want to be working in and out of design function, not up there all the time. Abby, right. add to that? Uh, it's just that the second picture we're showing is, is showing a really extreme version of that and how much the shoulders and the neck would then have to compensate for this extra rise of the arms on a regular basis during our plane. Another thing that comes along with this altitude issue is the lack of collarbone support. And we can see in this photo where this person has really raised, I believe it's a wolf uh, shoulder rest to such an extreme here to try to compensate for their long neck or accommodate, I guess I should say, their longer neck. And we can see that the collarbone here is not supporting the instrument at all. And we're gonna talk more about this collarbone support in a little bit. Let's take another look at an example of a lack of collarbone support. Right, and again, you might say, well, so what's what's the difference? I mean, why, why not have the instrument be supported out here along the chest? The reason for that is that um, the trapezius muscles, which support the, the shoulders and extend all the way to the top of the head, are, are not designed to be load-bearing muscles. They're designed to be muscles that swing, just like a trapeze. That's why they're called. Exactly. exactly. And, and when, that, when that motion is lost, or when you ask muscles to do something that they're not designed to do, then you can have a dysfunction and pain problems. Also, load bearing is best at the spine. And so the collarbone, uh, very close to the neck, that's an ideal point of support, as opposed to being out along the, the collarbone and across the chest. Okay, let's now look at the factor of scroll pitch. And this is one of the first things I think that teachers tend to address, which is the rise of the scroll in relationship to the shoulder or being parallel to the floor or you know bring your instrument up all of those different things okay so let's look at scroll pitch and this can be really affected by multiple factors let's take a look here here's an example of too low all right so we can see in this picture that the instrument is drooping quite a bit and then we can also see that he's got quite a uh, i wouldn't say unique chin shape but it, the chin shape there really needs to be accommodated by the chin rest and what he's using there just, just isn't doing it. All right, and let's look at another, this is another example of scroll pitch. And this one is the opposite issue. Talk a little bit about this one, if you would. This particular person had been encouraged by her teacher to indeed keep the scroll up. I think it actually became kind of a moral issue. It's like, if you are my student, you have to have that scroll up. Well, for sure, she got the scroll up, yeah. but take a look, it's actually too much. And this is another person that she had really severe shoulder lift to right. the point that actually she had bent her shoulder pad, this metal shoulder pad underneath. So it was actually touching the back of the instrument, just really severe stuff going on. And her shoulder had done that. Something visually that's really interesting to keep an eye out for is something we can call the daylight factor or just simply daylight. And what we're talking about here is daylight between the instrument and the skin of the neck. And that would be a sign that the instrument is possibly not on the collarbone. It could be, but also biggest factor I think we're looking at here is that it's not close to our center of gravity so that we can use our head weight well when we want to, when we need to. And also to not have the instrument kind of coming away from that center of gravity so that the head is then needing to do different kinds of things and we get into these bad habits because of this factor. Let's look at a picture that really shows this. So this particular person uh, didn't have a very tall neck but he chose a very tall shoulder pad um, because he thought that's what one should have and that somehow or another that was going to make his work easier. And so with all that extra height, it actually shoved his head up. And what that does, because the, the head weight can't uh, be lightly poised on the back edge of the chin rest, uh, the instrument starts to get away from him. It actually squirts out from underneath his jaw. And that's where this daylight happens. Okay, another aviation term that we use uh, to look at some of these issues with our instrument is roll. And that's going to be the actual angle 
of the instrument on the shoulder, uh, looking at the whole like face of the instrument and it's rocking or rolling. And let's look at a picture that really shows an extreme version of this. This can really affect our bowing in so many negative ways. We can see in this picture, there's an extreme roll of about 55 degrees. And you can also see this left arm coming backwards, the left elbow coming backwards. And notice that the shoulder's having to come up to meet the instrument, that the angle is just very severe between the arm and the shoulder. Again, you might say, well, so what's, what's the big deal? So if the instrument is, is rolled at 55, 55 degrees, um, should the instrument be flat or, or why? And here's the reason why, that we want arm weight to be released into the top of the string. And so if the instrument is uh, very greatly rolled down to the high string side, basically what you're doing is that you're playing on the side of uh, the string. And so the string responds differently. The, the bridge actually jumps differently. Uh, in its little dance on top of the instrument. Uh, you, you might get really great arm weight on the lowest two strings where we very seldom play, but on the top string, the bow is going up, up and down nearly vertically. What happens then in order to get sound, we actually have to add arm weight. And it's just, it's, it's overstressing the body. How do we avoid these problems? And how do we know how to use our body well so that we can work with these habits and get out of them and undo them? So let's just review a couple things. It's really important that we start with the head and the neck since the relationship, particularly what we're talking about that you've mentioned already is the balance of the head on top of the spine and that that relationship affects everything else in the body. Let's just review a couple pictures of anatomy. First, let's address where the top of the spine is. So you can see in this picture with the red circle, it's really up there inside the head. So it's very far forward. It's not in the back of the head. It's not at the base of the neck. And it's relatively in between the ears and behind the nose. And if you want to kind of find this yourselves or show your students how they can find this to understand this, simply just put the fingertips in the ears, imagine they're connected and do a slight nod to find the joint at the top of the spine. This is the atlanto-occipital joint. And this is where the neck can allow for the head to move or if it's gripping, turtling, clamping, that head movement is not going to be there. And we want to be able to employ head weight onto the instrument. So it's really important to know where the head is moving. Lynn, you've talked a little bit also about the trapezius muscle. So let's look at that picture really quickly and see the big trapezius muscle here. It's the surfaceal muscle of the upper back that stems from the back of the base of the head all the way down to the middle of the back and out to either shoulder. And like Lynn said, uh, you said this was for uh, movement, right? It's for range of motion. It's not for supporting the weight of the head. That's why it gets into a lot of pain and trouble. So what we really also want to look at are the deeper muscles that do some of that supporting work. So let's take a look at these suboccipital muscles. They're below the occiput, which is that ridge at the back of the head. And they're at the top of the neck there. And you can kind of put your hand underneath that ridge of the back of your head and just do that nodding movement again. Those muscles here are really responsible for helping that head movement. So knowing about those in order to release the head when it's nodding is really important. How do you know your chin rest fits you? It's great to know about that anatomy, but now how can we really apply it? And the first thing we wanna look about at is that we've talked about is that the instrument is on the collarbone. Lynn, can you speak a little bit more of that just briefly? I, I describe the, the collarbone close to the neck as being the shelf that the instrument, the, the bottom of the instrument rests on. 
Right. Again, the the object is to have uh, weight close to the spine, and that as you as you play, when you need it, particularly in shifting down or in wild uh, vibrato movements, you want to be able to apply that head weight with a little uh, backwards and down head weight. And it's light, it's not gripping, it's not clamping. It's just enough to catch the instrument and to keep it from getting away from you. So now that we have the instrument on the collarbone, let's take a look at something called the cantilever principle. You can see in this drawing that I've made of these arrows of direction. And let's look at the one on the left that goes through the head. We're setting up head weight by releasing the neck so that the head can rest into the chin rest. Through the chin rest also down to the shelf support of the collarbone. When you actually will put an instrument on the floor, like on a carpet, or you can put it on a table, do this with your students, if they don't believe you, do this for yourself and put some weight onto the very edge of the chin rest at the edge of the instrument. You will be surprised, possibly, you will see the scroll rise. And this demonstrates what our head weight actually does, which is to help support the instrument. Then there's about, I don't know, 10 or so percent left, that's just a guesstimate, of what the left hand is doing out at the fingerboard, which is helping to support the rest of the weight of the instrument and the leverage out in air and out in space, out of the body, away from the body. So to employ this head weight and get this cantilever uh, mechanism going on, let's talk about something I call head and neck technique. So Let's think about that as we find the top of our spines, okay? So think about your top of the spine again here. And what I'd like you to do is imagine your instrument is on the collarbone. The first thing we'll wanna do is not put our head directly right on the instrument. We wanna kind of allow some time for our habits not to come into play. Then thinking about that top of the spine again, look, right and left, allowing for the head to move. And then when you're over your imaginary chin rest here, you would look up and down, allowing for the movement at the top of the spine. And as we're looking up and down, we can release the weight of the head, softening the neck, so that the weight of the head really can rest into the chin rest. This is really important to help kind of circumvent our habits of clamping and turtling. It's also really important because it's a great way to check to see how our chin rest fits us. So if you go back and forth with the movement of the head following the eyes left and right, and then look up and down, as you release the neck and let the head weight come down, where the nose and the ear are kind of balanced here on the same level should be approximately your chin rest. If you have to tuck the chin a great deal, you know it's too low. If you can't let the neck release and you're stopped by the chin rest, you know that the chin rest is way too high. And here's a slide that kind of just lists the head and neck technique uh, if you'd like to take a look at the steps a little bit more um, in some detail here or jot it down. It's just an excellent way to not only find out about how your equipment is really fitting you, but it's also a great way to help people and yourselves and your students recover from injuries, recover from excess tension always going on in the neck and the spine. So when we're considering equipment, let's talk a little bit more about why we should start with the chin rest and what are the features of a good fitting chin rest, Lynn? The, the reason for starting with the chin rest is that in order for the head, the neck, and the shoulders, and therefore the body to function humanly, uh, to function as it's intended to, as we're intended to move, um, you, you want to start with this first. 
and uh, for some of the reasons that we talked about before. For instance, um, you want to, uh, in a chin rest, you are considering the height of the chin rest, that is in relationship to the height of the neck. Um, you are considering the shape of the jaw. Okay, so you can see that my jaw is fairly pointy. Um, and so therefore I would need a different chin rest than say Abby, whose jaw is fairly round. If they can just look at your, yes, yeah, you see Abby's is, is fairly round. Yes. Kind of more of a heart shape going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we see really pointed chins. We see sometimes square, broad chins, which are much, I think, less common, but they can be different degrees of that. Mm -hmm. And then we see really rounded. We can see a uh, heart shape, which can be a very common shape. Um, another really interesting feature of the jaw shape, I think, is the pointedness of the chin and how far that point out or comes how far that point of the chin comes out away from the spine because that really affects the shape of how the jaw is going to sit in that cup or dish and how the head weight will be caught or or, or supported. That's yeah. right. I mean, in, in some ways, choosing uh, a chin rest first is a little bit like choosing running shoes first before you uh, choose the the shorts that you wear or something right. like that um, you know or uh, the the tennis racket that you have uh, basically you want to maybe start with your shoes so that you have something that is going to um, allow you to move around well and allow you to move that tennis racket well as, uh, uh, the same so yeah um, the the height is one of the crucial features uh, the shape, just like we were saying, it's going to depend on uh, the, the shape of your jaw and in a certain regard, how far out the tip of your chin, chin juts. And um, also the, uh, the placement of the chin rest. And that has to do with whether or not it's over the tailpiece or left mounted. I mean, occasionally we do get people who actually need a right mounted chin rest. Very unusual, but it, it does happen. Uh -huh. um, now, some people might say, and actually, Mr. Roland said this: that uh, if you have if if you have fairly short arms, you'll probably need a chin rest that is half centered. But in truth, what it has to do with is care something called carrying angle. So the carrying angle has to do with stand up. Oops, has to do with how far out your arm flares from your body when it's just resting at your side. And you can right. see that mine does flare out quite a bit. Um, there are other people. A Abby, is yours about the same? Do you know? Mine is fairly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So if you allow. Yeah. So actually, Abby has considerable flare, too. But there are people that the arm will hang down directly to their side. Yeah. Right. And but so. Other people's will kind of come out pretty far like that. that like that's that. right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So it's actually carrying angle. And I think if Mr. Roland were around today, he would say, oh, yeah, that's actually what it's due to, because I've seen some really big hulking guys that take half-centered chin rests and uh, fairly petite women who uh, need it off to the left. Mm -hmm. So that, that doesn't square, but it really does square when you consider carrying angle. Um, do, do I allow, do I actually calculate carrying angle when I'm doing a fitting? No, I don't. But basically what I do is that I allow the player to show me by the way they're positioning their instrument. And if you saw some of my left hand presentations and actually some of the bow too, you would see that, that, um, reaching up tip of the thumb in, in the curve of the neck, reaching up to the end, uh, towards the end of the fingerboard, and then placing it is going to give you an accurate description of where that instrument is going to be placed uh, according to your carrying angle and also the length of your little finger, degree of flexibility of the arm. That's actually what I use to help decide where the chin rest should go. Great. It's, it's not fashionable. I mean, it's not a fashion. It's not because one player or another uses a chin rest that's there. It's not because one teacher says, well, that's where I, my chin rest goes, so therefore yours should go there. That would only happen if your carrying angle is the same. Right. And using a, a specific chin rest shape, uh, again, it has to do with the shape of your jaw and not what your teacher says.
Okay, in an actual chin rest fitting, uh, actually the chin rest fitting begins for me when a person walks through the door. And I'm noticing how they move. I'm noticing if one shoulder is, if there's a disparity in shoulder length. Uh, I'm noticing from the back whether or not there's, don't look too hard, a dowager's hump. Uh, yeah, uh, it tells me something about the way the person has been using their body thus far and about problems that we might be running into as far as finding a good fitting chin rest. Um, one of those aspects too is going to be uh, in the actual fitting, whether or not the head is, is able to stay upright. Um, also noticing whether immediately the, the person goes like this, and that tells me that there is a habit that's interfering. Right. And then also it's developing a way to express what the head actually needs to be doing on top of the chin rest. And Abby had talked very nicely about this, that it's, it's a yes and a no. Can you do that on top of the chin rest and not have this or this, or it's like, eh, no, I'm bumping into the edge of the chin rest. Right, we should be able to clear the chin rest when we say no, we shouldn't have to get up and over it. That's right, uh, exactly, so very good. Down. That's yeah, right, really yes, yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. basically the chin rest shape should be according to who you are. You shouldn't have to reshape yourself. In order to fit the chin rest. Right, okay? right. Also, if the chin rest is fitting, if the chin rest height is, is adequate, the shape is correct, you're going to start to see ease in the shoulders. And again, this is where uh, you're going to begin to see this kind of T that's going on. Right. Um, the, the shoulders are level, the head is uh, nicely on top of the spine. Sure. And uh, also, we want to see if the, show you my collarbone. Uh, mm -hmm. We want to be sure that the instrument is resting on the collarbone close to the neck. And what we don't want to see is we don't want to see the, the, the instrument hopping over the collarbone. That tells you one of a couple things that the setup is too high and the head weight it can't sink down and back into the chin rest to draw it into the neck. Um, and that when, it's, when the player puts weight on there, it will shoot, tend to shoot over the collarbone. And Abby, is there anything else I need to say in that regard? Oh. Um, just that sometimes that can be complicated by also clamping. So sometimes it can be a combination of uh, factors. So to make sure that that left shoulder is not coming up. And then like you said, to make sure the head weight is really kind of released really releasing so that the, the head weight's helping to keep the instrument from falling out in a way, especially somebody has been clamping. So there are things to kind of recalibrate as far as pressure from clamping versus head weight and keep being able to keep the instrument closer to the center of gravity. That's right. Yeah. And and there there could also be, I, I don't see it often, but sometimes people be too much of a, a chin tuck and we don't want that either. Right. Uh, it's just just if if your head, if your neck is soft and your head rises up on top of your spine, that's about as much chin tuck as you need. Right. Um, right. All, and we saw that you need it to be on the collarbone, on the, the violin shelf. Um, also, the instrument should be, if, if the chin rest is the, the right shape, um, it should be about at a 22, a 22 degree angle to begin with. So this would be 45 and half of that would be 22. So again, that's your starting point. And that uh, angle should change and your head should have the flexibility to change it. For instance, when you play on the G string, so I might do a little looking right to get to the G string. And if I look left, that's going to flatten the instrument a little bit. So my hand weight is on top of the, the, the string as opposed to playing up and down as we see many players. The right. eyes and the ears are approximately at the same level. So you draw a line across here, that should be roughly at the same level. I'm not even sure if it is as, as you're looking at right. it. Right, and yeah. I tend to look sometimes from the middle of the ear towards, towards the, note. the nose. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. but again, it's, it's, it's 
looking at each person's features individually and because not everybody has features in the same approx you know approximately they're in the same places but right, right. but yeah to to see the ease in the neck to see the weight of the head being able to release um that's that's just a key component and doing a lot of movements to check things out and make sure we're thinking during the chin rest fitting that's right and then also we're, we'll be asking the the player um are there any particular if they say oh that's not comfortable you want to say where is it not comfortable <laughs> are there any pressure points point to the place that it's not comfortable because often what happens is that what they're saying is that this is different right exactly right the difference is always going to be there because it's not our usual habit so in fittings we are always wanting to ask people can you describe that more can you use more adjectives more language to describe it is it is it just pressure on your collarbone that you've never felt before or is it piercing and digging like a dagger into the bone you know and trying to some people just aren't used to feeling that um that contact point the contact point of the instrument on the collarbone or they're they're not used to feeling head weight coming down whereas they're just used to the clamping kind of pressure. It's, it's just very interesting to make sure we're discussing all of that with them. That's right, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and that I, I say, okay, do a little head, say yes on top of the chin rest and say no. And that little bit of head bob just at the bottom of that, that's where you should encounter the chin rest. Right. Again, the head likes, to, likes this little bit of release. That's probably why we don't say yes this way. Right. <laughs> this way exactly okay? because exactly. that's that, the muscles work very nicely that way and support right and all of this is really just helping to set up the cantilever principle that we've been that we've been discussing that's Absolutely. right and the, the cantilever principle the, the the releasing your head weight you'll particularly notice that in in a shift down where the instrument is trying to trying to get away from you so the chin kind of catches it you might say right. but in a shift up there's no reason that your chin actually has to stay uh, on the chin rest, you can actually lift your head off. Um, when you're playing, you should be able to just kind of look around a little bit. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and but some of that can be very foreign to players. I think it's interesting to note as well that it is important for almost every jaw shape, in my opinion, to make sure that there's something underneath, behind that ridge of the chin to catch the head weight most of the time we're not going to benefit from a completely flat chin rest. Right, right. And that's quite frankly, that's why the Guarneri chin rest does not work for many, many people. Uh, okay. We found when we did a little experiment that it fits only 3% of the population. <laughs> yes. Isn't yeah. that incredible? So Isn't yeah, that... and you see it on you know, like 97% of the instruments. So uh, just, just beware, it really should fit you it shouldn't fit your name a favorite violinist right. uh, because that favorite violinist is not you. And if you'd like more information on the fitting process or um, information on kits to use for fittings, things like that, there are tons of great pictures and more information on chinrest.com on that website. Now we're going to look at a few pictures that show an, a case of changing equipment that has really improved a lot of significant factors. Some uh, discussion here. Look at what we're seeing. My goodness. Sure. So uh, that white vertical line is showing how his neck is displaced to the left in order to hang on to the instrument. And also you see some rise in the shoulders as well. So there's this clamping that's going on. Right. And let's look at the after photo now. Okay, so you see that uh, it's not totally remedied, okay? But there is improvement. Uh, no longer is the head severely pulled left. It's just moderately left. Uh, shoulders, I can't say that it's improved really at all, but uh, we'll, we'll take what we can get. And that's when we're really dealing with habit. That's just the habit is so strong. The clamping is still residually there. All right, let's take a look at another photo. Okay, this is specifically showing some of the forward head we were talking about before. Yeah, so there you, you really see his his neck is, is craning forward, turtling, as Abby calls it. And you see that stretch of skin at the arrow. 
a very good example of forward head. And let's check it out after now. So much better. Yes, right. And you see that his head is pretty much nicely balanced on top of his spine. So no longer this, but yeah, the chin approaches the neck a little bit better. And you don't see that stretch of skin underneath uh, as well. Eyes are pretty much level. Okay, and let's look at uh, one more example. I think this is still the same person. Here's his roll, which is really extreme, 45 degrees. Mm -hmm. And he pretty much would be almost vertical on that highest string with his bow. And you also see that the altitude of the instrument is quite high. So if you look over the bridge, there's his mouth. Right. And that means again, that he's having to reach up really high to get to the strings out of design function, in fact. Sure, and he's brought the instrument up using the shoulder rest to get close to the jaw. And you can see even from this angle how that's pushing his head into a slant. Okay, let's look at the after now. Big change. Oh my, yes. So it was at 45 degrees, now we're at 31, much improved. It's not down to around 22 or so where we'd like it to, to be. At least I kind of say, we can get it in that mid 20s, that's great. But if we can get it into thir the 30s from the 40s, especially the low 30s from the mid 40s, then that's doing really well. And that's, that's moment to moment change. So from old equipment to new equipment. So he's had no time to play with this at all. Right. But yeah, this is just to say, this is what changes can happen if equipment is fitted to the person. Okay. Okay, so this is the chin rest that this young man ended up with. And you see that it does have a definitive shape. There's a little bit of a, a lip here and a little bit of cut out here for the jawbone to go through. Right. But this little bit of a lip right here, uh, that's what he what one would hang on to when you need it. Mm -hmm. um, also, that, that cutaway provides relief for the jawbone. Right. And you see that his neck at that point needed a little bit of extra height underneath it. Right. But, uh, yeah. So that's what he ended up with. And this is the, uh, this is what I use to analyze what a person needs. It's called a lift. This is the lift. And then here's the topper. That's the right. shape. And that fastens onto the top, either left of the chin of the tailpiece or half centered, as we call it. Right. And for more information about the kits and different parts that are used in fittings, you can go to the website if you want. Here's another picture just to show uh, a beautiful custom chin rest on an instrument. And this is a Rondo. And the reason I wanted to show it just because you can see the lift and how it can go over the tailpiece to accommodate uh, the needs of the player. So if you um, subscribe to any of the online chats for um, for string players and specifically violinists, violists, there will always be a huge conversation about shoulder pads. And, <laughs> and uh, this is what our view is on shoulder pads. And, and also I have to tell you that actually what Mr. Roland's view was, was that there is no shoulder pad uh, except for the play on air, which allows the, the um, arm to pivot underneath the instrument. So more recently, this is what we've come up with. Abby? Right, so the major benefits of a uh, well-fitting shoulder pad or a shoulder pad that would not inhibit uh, movement or um, negatively affect the player would be that the more minimal we can go, the less the head, neck, and back are locked up in playing. So a lot of the hard shoulder pads that we use are going to basically lock us and kind of immobilize us into a rigid position so that often we can't move the head, we can't move the shoulder around, the collarbone that actually kind of rocks in the body when the elbow is moving back and forth for shifting and movements all around the instrument, the collarbone can't do that. Um, it also is going to put strain on the spine incredibly and on the muscles, the trapezius, the deeper little muscles between the shoulder blades and the spine, it's going to really cause 
men, most people, I would say, to have worse habits of gripping mm -hmm. and clenching. So we want that left arm free to move, including the collarbone. And we also will have another included benefit of not having a hard shoulder pad, and that is that we get improved sound. We're freeing up the bass bar to resonate. We're freeing up the natural uh, dynamic resonation of the instrument. And we actually, whenever we take the shoulder pad off, uh, when we're working with people, Lynn and I work with people, we often have people's faces light up. They go, oh my gosh, I've never heard this sound before. Or they've never felt the resonation in their chest through their collarbone. It's just, it's really pretty remarkable to see that, that change. Now, if we are transitioning and going through an injury, then we can get into a little bit of a, of a process. And that's when something like maybe the play on air would be helpful. Um, another really interesting one is called the shore tone. It doesn't clamp on and it has a lot of mobile pads that you can move around and, and try to work with helping for minimal support without going kind of cold turkey to nothing or to something super minimal. Sometimes larger foam pads can be also a transitional shoulder rest to use. Some people, I know Lynn, you can talk about this, some people can go cold turkey from a hard shoulder pad to nothing. Other people might need some transitional time and other people then still might need more transitional time. So to know that it's a process and to keep really observing ourselves is really important. If you are making this change from shoulder pad to no shoulder pad or even making a change to a different shape chin rest you you will want to allow time you don't want to be backed up uh, and have one performance after another you really do need time to pay attention to yourself and to listen to your body as you're doing this that's important time is important if you if you got yourself to a point of pain over time you're going to get yourself out of pain over time as well Again, just remember that the chin rest isn't going to do it all. It does have to do with you as, as well. Occasionally, there can be reasons to use a hard shoulder pad. There can be some pain or injury history that can require then a longer transition or learning gradually how to take away the hard shoulder pad over time. Um, also, congenital issues sometimes um, as we've talked about, maybe someone, for instance, with a, you know, hugely rounded shoulders and head forward, uh, if there's nothing, if, if the, there's nothing to help out with the instrument kind of floating or um, if the collarbone is completely receded, there, there can be, for instance, I have a 84 year old student. I don't think he could get away with not using a shoulder pad with the issues that he has going on. But sometimes those postural issues are, are quite severe. Sometimes a very, very heavy viola might also yes. want the use of one. Anything else you want to say about that? Lynn? I liken hard shoulder pads to being like walkers. And uh, what Olympic runner uh, would need a walker? to hold themselves up. And basically, we need to be able to move as freely as an Olympic runner. We, we need that momentum that comes from our arms. We need that momentum when we would do shifting. Uh, our, our head needs to balance out those movements of the bow arm. And if we have a walker, that is going to um, greatly hinder our movements. One phrase that I really like that Mr. Roland said, I, I was very much a, uh, why Mr. Roland, why do you yeah. say this? Why do you do this? I said, Mr. Roland, why are all of these movement principles important? And he kind of sighed and shook his head and looked down to the floor and he said, well, if sound is created through movement, then the quality of our movements is going to determine the quality of our sound. And so it's not that we want to have extra, extra movement. It's just that we want to have appropriate movement, movement that is, uh, that comes from reaction to the music. It's, it's a physical reaction. And therefore we don't want something that is going to tie us down, whether that's a chin rest or um, a shoulder pad. It, it should be appropriate to us and to our needs and what's going on. 
We've really enjoyed sharing all of this uh, discussion and knowledge with you today, and we hope that you have learned a lot and can use this for yourself or your students to really continue on your path to more comfortable playing and producing really healthy, wonderful sound. Mm -hmm.